Today, um, I'll be speaking from the lectionary passage, um, Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. That's what I'll be speaking and teaching from today. If you have your Bibles, uh, if you have your phone, whatever you may have it on, um, I, I, you can't see it, but I have both. <laughs> um, pull it out and let's get into God's Word. If not, I think it'll be coming up on the screen. And the Word of God reads, Directed by God, the whole company of Israel moved on by stages from the wilderness of sin. They set camp at Rephidim, and there wasn't a drop of water for the people to drink. The people took Moses to task. Give us water to drink. But Moses said, why pester me? Why are you testing God? But the people were thirsty for water there. They complained to Moses, why did you take us from Egypt and drag us out here with our children and our animals to die of thirst? Moses cried out in prayer to God, what can I do with these people? Any time now, they'll kill me. God said to Moses, go on out ahead of the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel. Take the staff you used to strike the Nile and go. I'm going to be present before you there on the rock of Horeb. You are to strike the rock. Water will gush out. Water will gush out of it and the people will drink. Moses did what God said with the elders of Israel right there watching. He named the place Massa, testing place, and Meribah, quarreling, because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because of their testing of God when they said, is God here with us or not? My God, it's a whole bunch there. Today, I'll title the sermon by way of God's prompting, between a rock and a God place. Between a rock and a God place. But I'll start off with us, foundate us with a story. Um, I like to make a connection and something in reality to connect to something that we see in Scripture. Normally, that's how I remember the word and um, from um, responses from people. And when I've taught and, and, and watching people teach, um, it kind of gives us a staple where we can remember uh, the message a little better. So some of you might know, I've talked about it in some of my devotionals, some of you might not know. In this season, since the pandemic, I picked up this new hobby, very interesting hobby of just loving plants. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't even get it out my mouth to call myself a gardener. <laughs> I can't do it. I just want some pride. I don't know what it is, but I won't dare call myself a gardener. But I do have a love for plants. And what I think I truly love about plants is watching them grow. My calling, my life is a work of transformation because that is what it has been afforded to me. So I love seeing that happen for other people and playing my part. And so I'm a 99 cent store man. I shop at the 99 cent store. Ain't no shame in my game. And I found myself in the aisle one day and I seen they had some little plants. And I'm talking about the little bitty ones, the small, I mean the little, little bitty plants. Just a dollar. And, and, and something came over me. I, I want to plant some plants. You know, I don't have the gym no more. I don't have a lot of my outlets no more. So uh, uh, maybe this will be good for me. I love to see things grow. So I go by these two little plants. Some people that may be interested in what kind of family or what kind of plants, uh, they're, the, they're of the succulent plant, which I found out it don't take a lot to take care of anyway, so it ain't like I got to do a lot of work. But I was just excited to buy these two plants, and I intentionally made sure I bought the smaller you know, some were like medium grown, some were like bigger, but I bought the ones that seemed like they were just starting their process of growth. So I buy the two plants, I get them home excitedly, I put them in the backyard, I position them in a place where they can receive sun, and I get the water in them every day. And the first week, growth, 
Amazing growth. I, I mean, I would come outside and check on my plants daily. Just like, wow, they're really bl- growing. Second week, growth. I'm talking about just growing, y'all. But the, the third week, disappointed. Not, not really no growth. About three more days uh, 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 after the third week, like, disappointed. No more growth. Or maybe it was growing, but it wasn't growing like it used to be. And I, 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 I had to figure something out because I was troubled. These are my plants. We got a, we got a relationship now. Like, I, I, I got to shepherd these things good. I got to take care of them. And, and the light went off in my head. I almost want to call it a revelation. Replant. Now, I had a moment when this replant word struck in my mind. Where you know that from? What you know about replanting? Anything. And I didn't figure it out to a while down the line that I, in my past life, I know something about replanting. Might not be these plants, but it's some different kind of plants. I knew something about replanting. But when I thought about replanting, I had never had experience with replanting anything, so I, I, I did my best. And I, I did like Wayne will do. I was rough with the plant, took the little plant, and I grabbed it, just like this, just to take it out. <laughs> now, I know some of my gardeners, some of my green thumb people probably like, Brother Wayne, what you doing? I, that's me. We, we, we finna make this happen. So I grabbed the plant, and I, now they're not that big, y'all. They done grew about this. They done grew in double size. They about like this, little bitty thing. But my, my intention was that when I take the plant out, the whole, all of the soil will be so compact that it will come out together. That was what I thought. Don't judge me. That is not what happened with this first plant. I moved the plant, and I pulled it, and only half of the soil came out. I had a moment of panic. But then it dawned on me that what I haven't told you is in the day that I chose to replant, I actually went back to the 99 cent store because I realized I had to make a place for the plants to go. So I found some bricks in my backyard, some of the bigger ones, the longer ones, that's like, like that wide and like, and I got six of them and I put two across, one on the side, on each side and two across. I was proud, y'all. I was really proud of doing this. And I took the soil, bought about five bags of soil, and I put the soil in the, in the, in the place. I made a place that was going to be better for my plants. So when I pulled it out and the soil didn't come all the way out, I had the moment of panic, but then it dawned on me. I have already prepared a place for the plants. What else dawned on me is the soil that was still at the bottom of the pot wasn't necessary for the next move. The nutrients that had been used for the last season wasn't necessary for the new season. Why is this important? Because so many of us feel like we've been pulled out of what we thought was our comfortable place, what we thought where we thought we were assigned. But God is saying in this season, I'm doing some replanting. For the second plan. I said, okay, I'm going to try something different because that didn't really work, just yanking it out. Don't judge me. This one, I chose to just turn it upside down. Just turn it upside down and hope that it fall out. Guess what? It actually did. The soil fell out intact. Here's what I noticed about the second plant. The roots were hitting the side of the wall of the little pot it was in. The roots were hitting the bottom, like the roots were actually showing all around the dirt, which told me it had outgrew the place that it was in. And so many times when we feel extracted, when we feel like we're in a place of uncomfortableness, when we feel like we're going through a valley, when we're going through a journey, God is saying, I know better than you do for you. And I have to do some replanning. I have to take you to the place I have prepared. But guess what? The process doesn't always feel good. And that is what we find in this scripture. We find the Israelites and Moses traveling through places that feel uncomfortable. But what I have to highlight about the Israelites is this is not the first chapter of their lives. So when you read 
where they, they call Moses out. It says, but the people were thirsty because there was no water. Now, we understand that water is so necessary for us to live. But, but there was no water. They complained to Moses, why did you take us from Egypt and drag us out here with our children, our animals, to die of thirst? What I'm going to do is there's three characters that I'm going to extract a little bit out so we can learn something from. The three characters I'll tell you now is the Israelites, Moses, and God. When you're in a season between the rock and the God place, there will be a process. And many times, we will be like the Israelites. See, I know if you like me, when I read this, I judged the Israelites. Why are they coming at Moses like that? Moses has provided for them over and over. Why are they testing God? But then, I had to think about it. This ain't the first chapter of the Israelites' life. And so many times when we judge not just people but ourselves, we are judging based off the season and the place that we are now. But my main point in today I want to leave you with is we are in a season where there has to be more grace afforded than ever before. We need to be giving grace to each other and giving grace to ourselves because God has given us grace in abundance and we have to position ourselves and condition ourselves where we're giving grace to people but also being graceful to ourselves. Because what we don't need when we go through all of these seasons of injustice is we don't need to inside battle. We're already fighting so much much on the outside so the last thing we need to be is defeating our own selves between the rock and the God place it's a process and it's a journey but grace must be afforded in abundance and you see the Israelites they challenge Moses and they come at him but here's the thing I need to tell you I had to take a flip back into the third chapter, which equals 14 chapters earlier. And this is what God, when he introduces Moses to his assignment to lead the Israelites, this is what God says. God says, it says, then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the powers of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile, spacious land. It is a land of flowing milk and honey. That, my people, is the promised land. Promised. Get that right. We say promise, but it's the promised land because it's already done. It's already done. And that's important to know when we pay attention to Moses' leadership because he stood on this verse as he led the people. If he didn't stand on that, he would have bailed out a long time ago. This passage allowed him to give grace to the people. So when we judge the Israelites, let's do a reflection on our own lives. Because what we see in the Israelites, my people, is a dependency on man instead of God. And in the seasons where we're between a rock and a God place, it is easy to come to a place of being dependent on people, places, and things more than we are on God. And in this, in this challenge, it is even more challenging because he is a worker of God. And what we can't forget is when God gives blessings, when God supplies, let us not worship the, the person who supplies or the place that supplies or the thing that supplies, but let's remember the God that supplied the supplier. It is so important in this season that we remember this and not judge. Our first task is giving grace to the Israelites because they actually represent a lot of our lives. Our second task is journeying to visit our brother Moses. Look it, look it, I want us to really pay attention. Moses, response is important. Moses cried out in prayer to God. What can I do with these people? Any minute now, 
they will kill me. Now, let's stop. If, if somebody I've been leading, feeding, helping, working with, now make up their mind to kill me, I don't got the grace to stick that out. Moses is better than me. But see, Moses has been with God more than me too. He's seen God show up in his life over and over and over and over again. And also, he had the message in Exodus 3 that was already promised to him. What is the importance of this? The importance is to understand that we have to understand the promises that God has already given us. And the only way we can do that is by being in God's word. Being in the presence of God, what we know is Moses had his own time where he had to spend with God. So when he comes to, to a place of having relationship where there's a dependency on God versus what you saw the Israelites have a dependency on man, it's because he has spent more time with God. But what I want to understand, what I want us to understand is Moses had his own traumas, trials, and tribulations. Because Moses was like the plant, he was stripped away from his own people. These are his people, y'all. The estimate is no less than two million people he led out of Israel. No less. What a task. I don't want to lead ten. Two million. Yet Moses finds himself in a place where he's being graceful. But here's the difference. I want to point something out. Many times we beat ourselves up when we don't extend grace right away. Because many times we say, I, I shall not fear. Let me clear something up. Moses was fearful right here, y'all. And that is okay with God in this season. It is okay to be fearful. It is okay to cry out to God. God wants you to bring your cries, all of them, authentic. I don't care how they come. Is somebody listening to this right now and you've been withholding your cries because you think you're supposed to say it in a certain way, but God is saying, child, pay attention to Moses. He came to me challenging me saying, what, God, why? I'm, what am I doing with these people? But what I love about Exodus 3, when we read it, if you pay attention, God says, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people. So Moses know they are his people, the shepherd. What's the importance of that? You can't be God to people. You have to surrender people all the time. Even when God has assigned you to them with a big task, including your children, including the people you work with, including your husband, including your wife, including your family. You can't play God. The message in Moses is telling us surrender people to God or it's going to take you out. But what I love is there's an invitation here to be okay with having fear and struggle and pain. Moses went through trauma, y'all. He killed the man. I mean, if we really want to go back, when he came into the world, there was a hit put out all, on all the newborns. And his parents, with God's prompting, take him and put him in a little basket. And he gets found amongst some reeds. You talk about trauma? To put you in a basket. And then he ends up in a place that is not his place. And then he ends up doing some things that gets him 40 years in the wilderness, stripped away from his people like the uprooting, the replanting. But God had a plan when God took Moses to that place. He put him amongst the priests who end up being his stepfather, and he had to shepherd his flock. Do you see the intentionality of God? God took Moses, planted him with a priest, allowed him to be his father, and allowed him to shepherd his flock. All of it was for preparation. I invite you to say, God, what is this season that seems so bad and so horrible. What is it preparing me for? I want to be in your will and in your way, God. It is okay, child of God, to have fear. But the intent has to be moving to faith. It is okay to have fear. But we have to always be moving back towards faith. What happens so many times is when we know we're in a place of fear, the enemy comes in and beats us up and tells us you are bad and you are not good and you don't trust God. You know what I tell him? I sure don't right now, but I'm getting back to it. 
Yeah, I got some troubles and some struggles. Yeah, I'm beating my own self up for some things, but I'm going to get back to God. What I'm not going to do is give up on me because God ain't gave up on me. Child to God. That is the invitation from what we see in Moses. In this season where there's so much injustice, we have to be graceful. Can you put the clip up? We have to be graceful. Here's the quote I want you to remember. We must come to a place of believing and receiving God's grace so that we have grace to give to others and ourselves in abundance. I'm going to say it again. We must come to a place of believing and receiving God's grace so that we have grace to give to others and ourselves in abundance. Let me point out two things with that. Believing and receiving are two different things. Many times we believe God's grace, but we don't believe it for us. We believe it for other people. Because, see, we have this inside job being done by the enemy that comes for us, and he tells us that, yeah, they did that, and they did that, but you did this. And God is looking down saying, but the blood, the cross, covered it all. Receive my grace. Child of God, there's, there's an invitation to reposition and posture in a place of saying, I, I did it did happen. I did take it in my own way, but I receive your grace, God, because I know the blood and the cross was for me. But the reason why we need to be able to receive the grace, because you can't have what, give what you don't have. And so you have to be able to receive the grace, because in a season like this, when our family is struggling, when we are struggling, when our communities are struggling, the best thing we have to offer each other is grace. Somebody say grace between a rock and a God place. This is the journey, my brothers and my sisters. As we move on to visit God, here's what we see in the characteristics of God. It says, Moses cried out in prayer to God, what can I do to these people, with these people? Any minute they will kill me. Listen to God. What I love about when I read the scripture, there's a shift in the atmosphere. You hear the Israelites in total pain and trauma. And then Moses respond in fear, but with some faith. Then God. Nothing but peace, understanding, joy. I can feel it. God said to Moses, go on ahead of the people. Take in which you some elders of Israel. Take the staff you used to strike the Nile and go. I'm going to be present before you there on the rock at Horeb. You are to strike the rock, water will gush out, and the people will drink. First thing I want us to understand, God never discusses the problem. We serve a God that is solution-based. And why is that important? Because so many times we find ourselves in positions and in postures where the problem is overriding anything that God may, able, may be able to tell us. But we have to be able to come to God and then listen to God and receive God's grace. Many times we're scared to come to God because we don't believe God's going to respond like this. We think we're going to get beat up. But God is not like man. What is impossible for God? Nothing. Ask Mary. Ask David. Ask Paul. Ask Noah. Nothing is impossible for God including you, child of God. God is so graceful. God wants to show God's face to you. I am talking from experience. It is so amazing that I even sit here and I'm only under the hand of grace, but not only am I under the hand of grace, I'm empowered by the power of grace too. Grace is not just for the covering, but for the pushing of God's people. It offers us a power that we can't get anywhere else. God's grace is afforded to us in abundance. 
The reason why the word abundance is so important, because us as humans don't even have grace to give in abundance. It's not even to us. Moses, we don't have the amazing grace. A lot of times you hear people talk about amazing grace. That's only a sign to God because we don't have amazing grace. We just have earthly grace. But the amazing grace is this grace that's, grace that's afforded to us in abundance and it never, ever fails. Anything you've been through, anything you're going through, anything you're judging yourself with, God's grace is there to cover that. God loves you, child of God, beyond anything you can imagine. I'm talking from my own story. But here we see God gives Moses some very intentional instructions, and I truly love this part. God says, go ahead of the people, taking with you some elders, three things, Take the staff you use to strike the Nile. But bring this to a wrap. As we continue to understand what it looks like as we travel between a rock and a God place, we are saying we have to be graceful to one another, but also to ourselves, so that we have the grace afford, to afford to other people in this season all the things going on around us. What God tells Moses is so important for so many of us. Go out in front of the people. There's groups, people, places, things that God will bring separation. But what's important about this separation we see here is this is not separation of pain. This is separation in peace. What's the difference? When God tells you to step away in peace, a lot of times God is saying, step away in peace so that I can still have you to lead the people because I can't have you lead them unless I cause some space. But many times we, when we hear the word separation, we think about separating and pain and like I'm out, I'm leaving, I'm, 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 it's too much. And I just want to lift up to you that there has to be some intentionality and in understanding how God tells Moses to step in front of the people, not leave them. Here's why. Because there's some people, places and things that God has assigned to your next assignment. And if you choose and don't discern and you step away in pain and leave the situation, the person or the place, then it will take time. It will cause time for you to get to the next place. I'm, ask, I'm saying this because there's some people, there's a family member, there's a child, there's a church, there's a business, there's something that you have been in pain and God is saying, I'm not calling you to step away all the way. I'm calling you to step away for a reason and a season. I just want you to think about that. Because if I was Moses, I would have been like, step away, I'm gone, move. But that's not what God called Moses to do. He called him to make space because what I need to do, I only have, look at this, an assigned group. God tells Moses, take the elders. I'm wondering this season, what select people that God has assigned to you that you might not be remembering? What select place might have God assigned to you that's part of what God wants to do when God wants to take us from the mess to the miracle, when God wants to take us from the struggle to the strength, when God wants to take us from the breakdown to the breakthrough, when God wants to take us from trial to triumph, normally there are people that are assigned to the journey with us as we travel through between the rock and the God place. I wonder who are the people that God has assigned to you. It's something we have to think about because we live in a society of isolation, I can do it all by myself. And from the God that I know that is a triune God, there was this whole thing is about relationship. So I want you to think about the people that God would have you process through the rock and the God place with. He intentionally assigned Moses some people. But the last piece is my favorite part. It says, take the staff that you struck the Nile. Now, here's the funny part about this. When I heard, when I read this, uh, the first thing I thought is, why does Moses ever put this staff down? Like, I literally had a picture of me having a staff on my side like a superhero. I was like, that staff would be rocking. It would be right here. Anybody come walking past thinking they finna start something, I'd be like, man, you see it? You see the stab, don't, don't think about it. 
But listen, here's what God said to me through the whispering voice. What staff have you put down? What is the thing or the person or the place that I've used to do so many miracles and you got content and you've put it down? And then you go back and pick it up whenever it's time. And I can tell you the first thing it is is this. This is a staff, y'all. There's so much power. I can truly tell you that most of my miracles have come in my time with this. This is my staff. But then I also realized this week, in all transparency, my mama, me and my mother relationship now, because only me and her as her baby boy, we've been through so much. And only me and her know some of the trials and tribulations we've been through. But we had a little fight a couple of months ago and hadn't talked. And can I be honest with you? On Monday when I started preparing deeply for my, for my, for my, for my sermon, I tried to go to my, my prayer closet. God said, not until you call mom. Your mom is a staff. Your mom. And y'all, I'm going to be transparent with you. Me and my mama had the most amazing conversation of our life. I am not kidding. Of our life. When I called my mama, I said, how you doing, mom? Do you know what my mama responded? I'm throwing in the towel. My God. I had to pause as my mama baby boy. I had to pause. God, I'm, I'm heavy myself. I can't take care of mama right now. God said, my grace is sufficient. And I took a moment and I breathed. And I remembered, guys, this is nothing compared to what God has done. If God just told me that I can't have prayer time until I Come with mom. God has already given me everything I need. And I asked my mom, I said, mom, what's different about this time than all the other miracles I've seen God bring you through? Got quiet. And then I got the preaching to my mama. And y'all, we ended crying together. Breakthrough. I wouldn't be sitting here preaching like this if I didn't tap into that staff. That was a staff. They're a connection that are so powerful that God used in your life. It may be a person. It may be a place. It may be a thing. But there are things that we step away from just like Moses would step away from the staff. It's the same staff that God used to split the Red Sea. It's the same staff that God used to do so many miracles. This is the same staff that God used to break him free, break them free, and put so many things on the enemies. But what are we, what are we putting down that may be the staff that God has for us in between the rock in the God place. But don't judge yourself. Receive God's grace and return to God's place. Pray about what may my staff be. I know for sure it's this word. But I know I can't tap out of my relationship with my mother. I thought about it. I said every time me and that lady talk, the Holy Spirit enters the room. Every time. Because we get to testifying together. It's real life stuff. I'll end with this. The verse goes through one through seven. And I ask God, okay, I know that was what the verse in the, in the, in the lectionary, but can I, can I extend it, God? Because I see something. The next thing it says in my Bible, in eight, right after God supplies the water, it says, the Israelites defeat the Amalekites. What am I saying? This thing was preparing them for this thing. Because when you know about this story, this is where the young man Joshua was introduced and Moses ended up separated from the people on top of the mountain. Listen to me. Think about this. Moses ended up separated from the people. So what Moses ended up doing is practicing everything he learned in 1 through 7 for 8 through 15. And it ended up being the way of victory for these people. Moses ended up on the top of the mountain with two men beside him, holding up the staff. And the scripture says, as long as he held up the staff, there was victory. Whenever the staff came down, they would not win. Do you see how divine God is, God? 
And I just want to tell somebody, when you're between the rock and the God place, it's just preparing you for the next between the rock and the God place. This don't stop. God's grace don't stop. God's love don't stop. It's never failing. It's all lasting. It's all everything, God. God loves us so much, child of God. So in this season, we got to be graceful to each other, but also graceful to ourselves. I hear God saying, somebody, you have been beating yourself up long enough. I release you today. I hear God saying, I am taking you from the place of being stuck to the place of being stable. I am taking you from the place of mental breakdown to mental breakthrough. I am bre taking you from the place where you're struggling with your finances to abundance. But you have to trust me between the rock and the God place. Tell to God, I just want to invite you into receiving and believing God's grace. Because God's grace is so sufficient. I don't stand here just talking from the word. I stand here as a testimony of the word. Oh, where God has brought me from, we got to do a movie. It's God. It's all God. It's all God, child of God. And I pray today that we position ourselves in posture, ourselves in a place to receive God's grace and believe God's grace so that we have it to offer to others and ourselves in abundance. With all of the outside battles, the last thing we need is inside battles where we're beating ourselves up and beating up one another. I love you, but God loves you more. May you position and posture yourself to believe and receive God's grace. Thank you.